How to be a Christian in humility and generosity? I pick up two verses. One is verse 11 for you to remember by heart. For everyone who exhorts himself will be humbled, and who humbles himself will be exhorted. And then verse 14, they cannot repay you, but you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Jesus said this parable, he called this parable is a parable of wedding feasts. I believe when Jesus brought up this, it must be for him when he was young and being brought up in his own culture and he noticed what's going on in a lot of social banquet. And that's how he draw us as an, uh, in his teaching, in his parable. Now, I think for the last 30 years or so, um, at least, uh, there's a change in the New Testament world, I mean, uh, in the New Testament study. When I did my thesis on faith and shame, that is, seems to be quite new to many people in West. Because in the Western society, all this year, they claim themselves as a guilt culture. But they overlook, I'm talking about the West, in fact, in the scripture as well, in the East, that means Asia or Middle East, actually, the culture is being called as a shame culture. That the thing is, now the spiritual scholar go into study Jesus' time, before and after Jesus, and they call this as a Mediterranean culture. And the Mediterranean culture is dominated by the values of honor and shame. So there are scholars try to look at, for example, the New Testament and the Gospels from the window of honor and shame and try to reinterpret a lot of the scriptural message. And I can tell you this is one of the examples. Jesus picked up a social relation, a social banquet, a habit, a culture, and then talk about honor and shame. So you look at chapter 14, St. Luke. It's within the context. It's within the context of social meals. It's about social life. And within the uh, social meals, there are cultural patterns or I should say inherited social values people are supposed to follow. If you did not follow, you are going to be marginalized. You're not in the mainstream. And people, people will feel being shamed. Perhaps today, you know, uh, the, psych uh, the sociology try to reuse, re reuse other terms, what we say, social norm, the social norm in our culture. Now, I try to um, uh, divide, you know, the whole text, you know, from verse 7 to verse 14 into two parts. The first part is about Jesus taught his disciples to go along, now pay attention here, to go along with the social feast manner or social, or social value in order to be a humble person as humanity is a spirituality of a Christian. That is to say, 
Jesus didn't against all the social norms. He didn't against all the current social values. And you have to, uh, when you read the scripture, you can try to see where Jesus did that. And then we'll, we'll see very soon that when he talk about how you're going to play along with the social values, the significance of the tax is to tell you, you are not the host. So you are not the boss. You are not the one in charge. And you are only an invited guest. Now, I hope you can pick it up. Meaning, since you are only the invited guest, you can change everything. As a Christian, you go along with a lot of banquets, your office, uh, you know, a party, uh, your friends maybe invite you, and so you are a guest. And this is the occasion what Jesus trying to teach his disciples in that occasion, how you going to behave as a Christian. And he talked about uh, humility. And the second part, from verses uh, 12 to 14, Jesus changed completely to a new context and teaches the disciples how to be a generous host. And in that case, without necessarily following the social law. Because you are the host, and you can arrange and design and do something accordingly to your plan. And so, you have the jurisdiction to do what you can do. Now, I hope you can, you can understand these two parts. They are different. And that's why I end up with, in the second part, Jesus talked about, as a Christian, as a host, you have to learn how to be your father, the heavenly father. And Jesus tried to talk about, again, later we talk about the what we call the eschatological kingdom. How the Heavenly Father prepare his banquet, his meal to the world. So I say the first part of the parable is to teach humility versus pride and arrogance in self-understanding. The second part of the parables is to teach you to follow what God is doing in his eschatological kingdom. When God invites his people to his kingdom meal, such that we need to ask ourselves, are we doing Jesus' teaching in our personal spirituality in terms of our character? And the second is, second part is the church following what God is doing in this gracious hospitality to welcome people into God's kingdom with open hands. Now, let us look at the first part on humility when you are invited to a wedding feast. So, from verse 7 to uh, 11, and uh, in this parable, precisely, Jesus focus on the question, if you are being invited, where do you sit? Where do you sit? And would you choose the seats of honor without regard for others? Then we have to uh, have some kind of uh, cultural background behind the, the parable and understand what's going on the, uh, about the social setting in the wedding feast. I have uh, bring you a picture. And, uh, you know, this is a usual Jewish uh, setting 
uh, when you invite people to your house. At a wedding banquet, the seats of honor would be close to the host. Seats for the meal are usually set in a U-shaped pattern. I hope you see the the picture and you see the U-shape. And, uh, you know, Jesus in the central, this is about Last Supper. And usually you have two to four guests reclining on each coach. The host will sit at the base of the U. You mean you shake or you, right? So you see the central part. That is the host. Where's the most honored guest? On his left or right? Remember his disciple, you know, before Jesus' uh, crucifixion, asking who will be seated the right and the, and the left, because that is the honor, seats of honor. And remember the first uh, chapter in Hebrew, chapter 1, and said Jesus, the, uh, the ascended Jesus, sit at the right hand of the Father. Well, right hand representing the, icon, uh, the symbol of honor. So once you are being assigned the seat, people will see who is the honor guest. And the seat sometimes, or most of the time, representing prestige. And the prestige will come with a certain kind of power and status. And then after, you know, being arranged and sitting, they will be, you know, arranged the washing of hands, washing of feet, uh, washing of hands for cleansing uh, uh, before the meal. So with that understanding of the cultural background, now you look back to the parable, and the parable then will be very straightforward. And as, as I say, in Jesus' life, more than 30 years, he was taught, and a lot of time, uh, even in Chinese, you know, you don't have to talk explicitly. You have, you, you probably are going to observe and you know how, you know, when you, your parents, how your grandparents, how your relatives invite guests and banquets, what they do in terms of sitting. Those are something need to be observed in their manner. So by doing that, then obviously, every time, people would watch, hey, this banquet or this wedding or whatever occasion, who will be sitting beside the host? Interestingly, when I was in Hong Kong, you know, I mean, there are a lot of like uh, situations like TV, big show, banquet celebration, anniversary, and, uh, you know, those big uh, guy, you know, the, the president, the boss, when they do a big arrangement in the TV show, for example, they're very concerned about who will be the next one. Who is the one next to the next one? And there's a lot of discussion and commentary over that. The same situation I can imagine when Jesus was brought up. So here, in this Everyone understanding what the culture, tradition, Jesus warned his disciples. If you quickly grab the high seat of honor, and if a person more distinguished walk in, it will be very embarrassing and shameful. When the host asks you to move away from the honorable seats, I'm sure you, you get it. Right? So sometimes when we come to the uh, banquet in the, in the church, you know, people would really try to sit back and say, oh, I don't sit in the front table or whatever. Maybe no one is going to sit beside the bishop anyway. 
But then Jesus said, if you choose the lower seat, when the host comes and invites you to the seat of honor, you will be honored among all guests. Now when Jesus said that, he used the word glory, doxa, or you know, a lot of time you hear the word doxology, right? In worship, that's about the glory to God. Now he used that Greek word doxa to characterize the honor that results. In other words, Jesus used a very important word and to tell you the sense of honor is important also equivalent to in the, in the future one day in God's kingdom. So by doing that, Jesus concludes, for everyone who exhorts himself will be humbled. And to humble himself will be exalted as a guiding principle for Christian personal ethics. Now we need, we need to set back a little bit. You might ask, is it new in Jesus teaching everybody? You know, is there anyone in Jewish tradition who taught about the same understanding or the same teaching or the same moral ethics. A scholar actually see, uh, find that um, they are actually having similar kind of teachings in Old Testament or Jewish tradition. And I'm going to tell you two uh, examples, two, two texts. The first one is Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 17, verse 24. The Lord said, And all the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree, and make high the low tree, dry up the green tree, and make the dry tree furnished. I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it. You see, there's a difference, a similarity over there. The idea is high become low, and then low will be raised to high. The other text is Proverbs chapter 25, verses 6 to 7. Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a lobo. Now, the second text is even closer to what Jesus said, right? Oh, I would say, actually, Jesus studied the Old Testament, and Jesus actually coming from the same spirit of that Old Testament teaching and to put forward right now as a guiding principle for Christian personal ethics. In other words, what Old Testament teaching, Jesus pick it up and along that and to teach his disciples in New Testament. And I said that not everything, I'm saying not everything, but not everything, but not everything, Jesus against the current culture or current cultural teaching or the traditional teaching. Because the teaching is actually talking about a few things. One is the sovereignty of the host. And the, two, and the two texts also talk about the sovereignty of the king. And who is the king? The Lord. The, the heavenly God. And the important thing is the teaching of the virtue of humility. 
Now, I won't go there, but I want you to know it's a very complicated but a very simple guideline understanding of ethical theology is we don't disregard everything uh, what the tradition and culture uh, society or what you learn from university. I'm talking particularly in humanity science. If those things actually the same as what God is teaching in scripture, we go along. So we're not going against it. That's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus do. It's because the belief is every whatever goodness is coming from God. God can reveal himself through the church, through his people, through Israel people, but also God reveal himself to people who don't know him. Because everyone is a child of God. We are all children of God. And God reveal himself in a very mysterious way to different ancient, ancient cultures. And that's why, for example, in Chinese, you can able to study traditional old ancient Chinese literature, what they believe, and you discover there is a malarity over there because of the revelation, all the goodness of revelation is coming from God. That is what we believe. So here, what, what, what do we learn? How do we apply? Is we have to remember humility is the mark of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and us then therefore also his followers, I mean the Christians. The best what St. Paul said about Jesus' humility and how he raised from the lowliest to superiority is in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 11. Here, St. Paul said, Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equally with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see the movement from high to no and then the movement from low to high. Jesus' humility demonstrates the best example for us. God will raise him up from nodius to the seat of glory. That is how we look at Christian self-understanding. How we deal with our self-importance, or in a certain extent, self-promotion. This is what you learn from social science, psychology, and everything. They try to help you to affirm yourself and uh, how, how to promote yourself and so on. But what Jesus said here is very different. It's about humility and God, there's a God who will raise you up through whatever you do. And don't be and try to be resist any temptation or seduction from this world to exert today in the West much about personal right for our own self interest. The, the second part of the parable, generosity. When you are invited people to a meal, now we come to the second part. You're going to invite people to a meal. That is to say, you are now a host and have the jurisdiction to set the invited 
guest list. Jesus made use of this parable to teach God's meal in his eschatological kingdom. That is to say, whom God will invite to his kingdom dinner. In contrast to the current racial Roman culture and Jewish traditional thought, God invites everyone to his kingdom. God's hospitality is open to all. God's invitation is not along with the current racial Roman social custom, or they call the social contract. And the social contract today we name as payback hospitality. Let's say it again. Payback hospitality. What does that mean? It, it means that, it, it mean that you invite those who will do the repayment by the return invitation of banquet or the return of benefit or reward of your favor interest. I don't know whether you hear about that. I, I heard a lot. You know, people taught me, you know, how you arrange your banquet, you know, in your, in your career, vaca uh, vocation, uh, vacation, uh, I'm sorry, I mean your job and everything. And even my parents told me when I was young, so that you can gain back the favors from the invited guests. That's the current teaching. Again, very popular. Everywhere. Every, everyone followed. But here Jesus says, well, to invite the poor, the crippled, the lamb, and the blind. Invite not just the Jews, that's what the Jewish people thinking, but all who turn to God regardless of race, gender, and class. Invite those who have no capacity to pay you back. This is to reflect what Jesus has done on the cross, dying for the people of the world. Not just the like-minded people, not just who receive him as the Son of God, but in fact everyone, including those who nail him on the cross, those who hate him. And that we flag the open hand of generosity of God. And here we are very soon to have Holy Communion. When Holy Communion, we're going to celebrate Holy Communion, everyone who receive Christ can come forward to take bread and wine, the body and, and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, regardless of your, your race or gender, your class. And we are equal. And we are all welcome in Holy Communion. So right here we have to think about how do we open our life to everyone around us? That is a personal level. On the church level, how do we outreach people all around us? I have to say, you know, uh, for the last 30 years, we try very hard to change, to, trans to transform our church in terms of mission. Then I quote some examples for you. 30 years ago, I think, I, I have been told that in North America, one of the things is church, the middle class church in North America failed to reach to a lot of people. Being marginalized in our society, one of the groups is restaurant workers. And we keep talking and talking and talking in a lot of conferences. But not many churches took actions. And I think based on that, we try to reach out to them and start with our, today we call the Taste of Life ministry. The other 
ministry has been done over t- almost 10 years now. It's Karan refugee. Not sure about you know what happened. Just a few months about, uh, ago, about talk about, you know, uh, there are people from Hong Kong, China, and Taiwan being kidnapped and killed in Southeast Asia. You know, uh, scary, very scary and horrifying. And that involved Miamaya and also Karan. Now, I don't know what about that. But I just remembered those Quran refugees whom we are serving and supporting is the Quran children in Thai border. And I'm sure you should know they could not pay, pay you back. We sponsor a family from Syria. Uh, that's another thing we have to learn. We sponsor them, but now they are kind of like disconnect with us. We spend a lot of energy, preparation work, many hours of uh, serving and finance. And it uh, seems to be not very rewarding in the sense that uh, we don't being actually being uh, well connected. But I said to myself, this is what we should do. We are not doing because of rewarding. Maybe God will reward, reward us in the future, but not now. And uh, not just that, you know, we can ex- expand to uh, a lot of uh, our finance mission outreach to Nigeria, Tanzania, Uganda, and recently Cuba, and also some of the brands are still working in Central America. That's a good part. That's a, a praise the Lord that we uh, keep doing that. I just want you to know that about six months ago, I received an email from uh, the Cathedral Western Malaysia Anglican Church. The dean actually connect with us to see whether we can able to help a family of from Pakistan. Pakistan. They are a family of five. The children, three children, they are not allowed it in schooling. Uh, taking us, you know, in a Muslim country, they they are not treated as a citizen. Have been locked up, locked locked down for ten years. So we are working on see whether we can able to part to do partnership and uh, helping them to come to Canada. But in COVID nineteen, we haven't made our decision yet. But we are working on it and see what we can do according to what God is going to call us. So I want to conclude what Jesus said this morning. The first part is to ask us to play along with the current good moral virtue in order to show our humanity and servanthood. The second part, particularly about the church Christian fellowship, is to learn how to put God's eschatological kingdom on earth in order to reflect divine grace, genero- gracious generosity. That is how we work with the Holy Spirit to manifest the enduring and the presence of God's kingdom on earth. Where we see God is in smaller things. Those we can able to do. We can't do everything. We can't help everyone. But those we serve and let people see God is there. And that's what the Lord's Prayer said. We pray God's kingdom on earth. So I want you to think about on hearing what Jesus is teaching in his parable. What will be our response? What will be our response? What do you do after hearing the morning gospel? What 
will change you in terms of humility and serving? Would you step forward to trust and love the Lord in obedience and follow the footsteps of Christ in the Holy Spirit? Amen.